Thank you all for coming. So I had the pleasure of introducing the same speaker last year. <laughs> uh, at the time, something I considered to be quite the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. <laughs> so it's really fun to get to do it again. It's also fun to look back on what I had written for my intro last year. I kind of touched on a range of things, expressing a lot of gratitude for the role that this man has played in my life. Um, for the lessons that he's taught me, the example that he set. Um, joshing him a little bit for some of his goofier moments. And also expressing a sense of really appreciation and even awe at his ability to savor the little beautiful moments in life, uh, to enjoy the view. So I'm really excited that he's back here today to share his message with us again. I think it's a really important and powerful message that's been influential for me in my life, and I hope you find some value in it as well. Before we get over to that, I'd like to share a little story. So, the story is from this morning. <laughs> <laughs> really. Um, I had uh, my clinic meeting for fellows this morning, which is a a uh, small group of five leadership fellows plus our leadership coach that meet basically just do a lot of touch feely type stuff. Um, today's assignment was to consider a scenario in which the world was about to end. The sun's going to explode. The human race is going to go extinct. And they've run a lottery, which you've won, to have eight of your memories from your life preserved as an homage and sort of a memory of the human experience. Uh, so this is quite the difficult process, and then as we progressed through class, we were asked to then <clears throat> chop our list down from eight to four, four to two, just kind of this grueling, these grueling decisions. And then we were asked to eliminate all but one, at which point everything became clear for me, and I knew what I was going to keep, and it was easy. The one memory that I wanted to keep was my memory of being at home over Thanksgiving with my family every year. We go out into the, on the grass fields in front of our house, play some touch football, running away from our golden retrievers, and also from dad. <laughs> Maybe falling down, get a little scraped up, get done, getting sweaty. Coming back inside and there's this amazing, beautiful feast on the table, and we all sit down. And before we start eating, my dad reads a passage from The Wind in the Willows. It's a particular passage where the character Mole has just stumbled back upon his home in the forest after having been away for quite some time on this crazy epic adventure. Mole's a humble guy and he's pretty nervous and even embarrassed that his home is not going to be very impressive to his new friends who are with him. But they slowly sort of start dusting off the counters and lighting some candles and cooking up some food. And sure enough, before long, they're all having a blast. The chapter ends with Mole laying down in bed, fully stuffed to the gills, and just so happy and grateful for having it all. For having a sort of sense of anchorage in one's existence. A place that gives that same simple welcome every time you come. So I want to take this moment to thank my dad and my mom, who's not here today, uh, for that anchorage in my existence. For that time, those times in, over Thanksgiving where I'm there with family and just feeling very at home, expressing love for my siblings and for my parents, and, and also expressing gratitude for everything that we're thankful for in our lives. Um, and also just want to note how special it is for me to be able to share little piece of home in the form of my father with all of you great friends and colleagues here at GSP. So thank you and please join me in welcoming Tia Baron. <laughs> tell you, some of you may have seen Brooks's talk earlier today, and if you didn't, please treat yourself to the YouTube version of it. Um, 
my goal in this talk is to be half as compelling as his talk. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, though, everything he just told you about me is highly suspect. And, and, and um, <laughs> all that good stuff is about as reliable as your typical uh, public offering prospectus. <laughs> Which is to say it's about as reliable as one of my fantasy novels. <laughs> but, now, with total credibility, I'm going to turn the tables and tell you a story about him. <laughs> which I hope you'll enjoy, which gives you a little bit of a, uh, an interview of my son Brooks. When he was four years old, we uh, lived in a spot on a hill in Boulder, Colorado, where, the, where we could go bicycling easily. We went for a bike ride, he had a flat tire, so we swung by the, the bicycle place, got the tire fixed up, and we're walking back and happened to walk past a pastry shop that has in its window this gigantic chocolate cake. Now, I swear, that cake weighed half as much as he weighed at that stage. But he saw that cake in the window and he said, Dad, I want that. <laughs> and, and I said, you know, those big up brown eyes, and I, I said, uh, oh, Brooks, look, we're, we'll be home really soon. There's going to be, we'll have an apple. <laughs> and, it up and, and there'll be a glass of milk. It'll be so tasty and healthy. And he said, I want that. <laughs> and I said, well, look, you know, Brooks, we're trying to, we save cakes for like special days. And he, and, and, um, and he said, but dad, today is my birthday. I said, Wait a minute now, your birthday is in November. This is May. And then without any hesitation, he said, oh, wait a minute, what I really meant was, today is my Italian birthday. <laughs> I tell you, my jaw just went to the ground and and you know what a parent does in an avalanche of cuteness like that <laughs> you give up so we, we bought the cake <laughs> we shared the first slice before we even got out of the pastry shop in fact which is all to tell you that even even at four years old he was a young entrepreneur <laughs> so you see many of those same same qualities of creativity and innovation and, and drive all, all the time now um, let me just let me just segue to say that um, I'm going to tell you a few stories about my crazy, bizarre life, but they're really not about me. They're really vehicles for ideas that I hope might be useful and helpful. And we'll have a good chance to have a Q&A afterwards, which is always the best part of these talks. So let me begin by just saying that ever since I was a kid, I've always loved a good story. Whether I was growing up as a small kid in New England or... Uh, a uh, somewhat older kid in Colorado on a ranch, I would always just get wrapped up in a good story. It might be told around a campfire, it might be a story I'd read in a book, see in a movie, <coughs> act in a play, whatever it was. Stories really had power for me. And so I, I actually, as it went on, I even wrote a few of my own. And after college, uh, and, and after some extended travels in Asia and Africa, I ended up at Oxford for a little while, and, and there at Oxford University, I wrote my first novel, and um, had, had started writing it actually on the Trans-Siberian Railway, and finished it off in the Himalayas, polished it at Oxford, sent it off. I thought I had dreams. This would kick off my writing career. I'd be you know living somewhere in a mountain cabin, writing books, I had all these big dreams. And so with, with high expectations, I sent off this book to the 32 different publishers. And I guess you could say it had a terrific reception because pretty quickly I got 32 rejections, complete flat out rejections. And you know, there's nothing, there's nothing nice and warm and happy about a rejection, especially 32 of them piled on top of each other. So this hurt and it was, it was a setback to put it mildly. Uh, and just to be fair, though, some of these rejection letters were not completely cruel, not totally impersonal. There, there, was, there was one, I think it was letter 28 or 29, not that I was counting, um, that, that it was just so touching, it was just like an arrow to my heart. It was so personal. 
It started out, Dear T.A. Barron. No, no, actually it didn't start out that way at all. It started out, Dear Sir slash Madam. <laughs> but they actually took the trouble to circle the word sir, <laughs> which really made it seem much more, made it much more personal. And then it went on to say, Dear Sir slash Madam, your work of fiction slash nonfiction, circle fiction, very personal, um, does not meet our standards for our spring slash fall publication list. And in that case, by the way, they circled both spring and fall, <laughs> just to make absolutely sure I did not miss the point. So um, I did not miss the point. Anyway, so this meant it's time for plan B. The writing thing was not going to work out. So I then did what many young people have done and will continue to do who have no clue at all what they're going to do next with their lives. I went to business school. <laughs> you might even know somebody. <laughs> but so I landed at business school and I did, I did my thing. And I actually was very fortunate. I ended up in a private equity group um, in New York City, which is the most unlikely place for me. But it, it worked. It was, there was great energy. Unfortunately, my partners were all smarter than I was. We had a, there was a lot of activity. Uh, I ended up as president and COO of the publicly traded side of the business. Uh, we had a few good deals, a few disaster deals. Fortunately, the good deals way outweigh the disasters. And, and um, after seven years, we were on the way to raising a second fund. I was in the prospectus as the new president of that fund. But something was wrong with this picture which was, I still had that yearning to write. I would actually still get up in the morning at 4.30 or 5 o'clock to just, just write, write some poetry or do a character sketch on some nutball investment banker we were, we were working with, or, do, or just, just imagine a storyline, or just to notice how the, how the leaves on a particular tree in Central Park would, would move as they fell to the ground. And I, I, and I really enjoyed those moments so much that they were very much part of me. And I, I realized that there was a disconnect here. And so I had the fun of uh, one day walking in and giving a nice financial report to my partners and then finishing up by saying, oh, by the way, I quit. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go join XYZ competitor. I'm moving back to Colorado where I grew up to see if I could actually write a book that somebody might want to read. Now, you can imagine the wave of support <laughs> that this, this got from my partners and the, and the uh, major investors who were there. Um, <clears throat> not. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, the lead investor, the guy who really uh, backed us at the very beginning, was so upset he came up to me. He was sheet white. He was shaking. And he put his, he just put his hand on my shoulder. He said, Tom, you just can't do this. And I said, I, I really, I know what I'm doing. I actually really do need to try to do this. And, and he said, you don't understand. This is your life. And I said, I, I really think I do. He reached into his pocket and he pulled out a beat up business card and he put it in my hand. And he said, Tom, this is my therapist. <laughs> you got to call him right now. We're up here on the 25th floor. He's checking the windows to make sure they're locked. Um, I, it was, I was seriously at risk in his mind. Anyway, with that wave of support, I was out the door. But um, all I can say is that decision moment, that point, was now <clears throat> 24 years ago. And um, soon to be 30 published books ago. And honestly, I haven't had one millisecond of looking back. Not a millisecond. It's been a great ride, especially with partners on the journey like Brooks Barron. <laughs> and it's, it's also been, uh, you know, it's been full of surprises. More good things have happened than I ever would have guessed, ever. Bestsellers and international editions, a, a movie in the works now, uh, all that good stuff. And, and on top of that, I get some wonderful letters. <laughs> And, and yes, some of them are very lovey-dovey and wonderful and heartwarming and inspiring. Uh, and they don't start with dear sir slash madam anymore. <laughs> but the ones I actually remember the most are the ones that just make me chuckle. Uh, there was one that I got from a California teenager a couple of years ago. I still laugh about where she, she wrote, uh, Dear T.A. Barron, I heard you speak uh, when you came to the public library. 
I came because, yeah, I like your books, but why I really came is that I have always wanted to write books myself. But I never thought I could actually do that until now. Now, freeze the frame. If you're like me, and you get a letter like that from some young woman out there who something I said might have inspired and encouraged to do her thing, I was feeling pretty good. I was feeling like, okay, that trip was worth it just for that. Then I made a huge mistake, which was I kept reading. <laughs> uh, remember she said, I never thought I could do it until now. And then she went on to say, because now that I have heard you speak, I know for sure you really don't have to be very smart after all <laughs> to write books. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. I, I get that kind of kick in the pants all the time. You write for bright young people. Well, here, <clears throat> all, all, all of this, all kidding aside, um, people often ask me, was it scary to change careers? Was it scary to make a, a shift like that? And the answer is, of course it's scary. It's always scary to make some changes in life. Uh, changing your job, changing your relationships, changing your location, all these are scary things. But the real question is, is that anywhere near as scary as coming to the end of your life and realizing your time has run out, but you had a dream. It was something you really, truly wanted to pursue. And you just never went for it. That's a really scary thought. That to me is far more frightening than trying and failing. Much more frightening is to never try at all. And when you think about that end of life moment, which I think is a very helpful perspective to take on these big questions, ask yourself, you know, what is it that with, if your sand in the hourglass is almost gone, what would you really want to have done that you knew you needed to try, even if it didn't work? Those are the, those are the things that really matter most. What I'm really saying, honestly, is all we have in life, all we have is two things, our time and our souls. All the rest, honestly, is decoration. We have our time and our souls. And so why not make the most of both of those things? The question is how, right? It's not an easy question. But let me give you a few, a few thoughts to amplify that. By the way, it's not an easy question for anybody, but I think it's actually even harder for people who have always been really, really good, as all of us in this room have been, at completing assignments that are given by other people. Uh, that's a very useful skill set to have. But at some point, you have to step beyond that and say, OK, I'm going to give myself my own assignments, my own task list. And that's, that's, where, the, that's where it really gets interesting. Because that's where you're, 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 you're invited to ask questions like, what do I think is success? What does it actually mean to succeed? And what are the metrics around success? How do I actually measure that? And even a level deeper, I think, than success is what makes a meaningful life for me? Asking that question is a big one. Now, you can go there by doing that end of life thought that I suggested earlier, or there's another way that, that actually has been very helpful to me, and I'll share it with you in case it's of use in your life. I find that it's helpful to ask two questions. One is an inward-directed question, and one is an outward-directed one. The inward one is really just simply, what, what do you love? What do you love? What do you really, truly care about? What gets that, that light in your eyes? What are you passionate about? And then the outer directed question is, what does the world need out there that I can help provide? 
And when you mesh the answers, that you will come up to those things. What do I love? What does the world need? What you have in that, in that package is the makings of a really remarkable life. So getting clarity on both of those things, but start with the inward one. Ask that inward question first, and then go outside. And then you can, then you can take it from there in your own direction. Thanks for that tea, Brooks. <laughs> <clears throat> now, uh, just to give you a little flesh on the bones of that. For me, when I asked those two questions, I, I really came up with three general baskets that, that really have helped guide me through life and, and really, really been the answer for, for my own quirky, bizarre life. Um, one is, won't surprise you, stories. Another is nature. And a third is young people. And, and, and just a word on each of those. Um, stories, you know, I've often thought stories are really like a, a kind of vessel. They're, they're a boat, really, that take us someplace. And, and the wonderful thing about stories is they carry us someplace outside of ourselves. But they also, at the same time, the best stories, take us inside. And that's because stories carry ideas in their hulls. They carry in their holes. They carry big ideas. Um, ideas like, like, what difference does one person's life make? Or, um, uh, which in a you know, way, that's really what the Lord of the Rings is all about. Even the smallest person can make a big, outsized difference to an entire world. Or questions like, how can we possibly learn how to live among ourselves and our fellow creatures in a sustainable way on this, on this beautiful but beleaguered planet of ours? Questions like that. Stories, by bending the mirror of our lives, they, they help us really face those questions. Nature, um, as, as all of you who have experienced the beauty and wonders of nature know. Nature is a place where you can both feel really very small and humbled, and also really enlarged and expanded at the same time. You know, when, when I'm out on, on a Rocky Mountain ridge at, 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 at night um, with Brooks or our family or just by myself or with a friend, and, and you see those stars there's so many stars you almost have to, have to squint to look up at them. They're so bright. Or, or, or when I'm walking by the ocean, which um, is so beautiful here along the California coast. Or, or in a deep forest, like I was on Saturday uh, with the ancient redwoods that grow here in Northern California. I know those kind of places you feel tiny, diminished, humbled, and at the same time, Expand it because you and I, we are all part of all that wonder, all that creation. So we're at the same time as we're, we're reduced by it, we are expanded by it. And, and that's, part of, that's part of the magic of nature. And, and of course, um, it's really true that if we can learn how to take care of this planet, she will take care of us. So there's a, there's, a, there's a wonderful relationship you can form with the natural world, one that's both inspiring, but also, also healing, and, and also renewing in all forms, of, all levels of grace. Then the third basket is young people, you guys. It's really, you know, really it's about, it's about the energy you all have about the, um, the can-do spirit, the, the high ideals that you have. It's about your struggles, your highs and lows, your honesty. I don't know, I, I'm just so moved by bright young folks like you guys. That's why I actually started a prize that, that um, turns the spotlight on 25 amazing young people every year, one that Brooks has been part of. To sum it up, Young people really renew my hope. 
But I should also say that I still worry about you. I, I worry a lot that, that the high expectations and the, and the pressures you feel, in part from all your successes, um, might limit you from creating your own task list, from, from following that, that dream. And so wherever it, the, the time is right and the place is right in your life, I really encourage you to do that. So honestly, to come back full circle, what this talk is really all about is uh, an invitation to see your life, your life, as a story, a story of which you are the author. So tell it with courage, tell it with passion, and make it the very, very, very best story you can. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now let's get to the best part, which is q and I'm happy to talk about any of those subjects tossed out there, those light, small, puffball subjects <laughs> that are interesting. Yes? I don't mean to date you with this question at all, but I was wondering, were you at Oxford at the same time as C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien and related? Who are your literary role models? <laughs> um, well, you know, you gave me the rare opportunity to say I'm younger than somebody, <laughs> uh, which I really appreciate. <laughs> um, I actually was not there at the same time as either of those great luminaries in the, in the world of fantasy writing, um, but I was there just after them, so I, I, got, to, I got to feel the aura of their being there, and, and, I, and had a few beers at their favorite pub, by the way, where the Inklings used to meet. And, and honestly, um, I, I, the most interesting glimpse I had was uh, to have a tutorial in history with the son of C.S. Lewis. Um, and, 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 and it was, it, it, there was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, interesting elements to that, and I won't, I won't get into that ex until we're sitting in, in, uh, in that same pub having a beer together, but, uh, but it gave me a sense of, of both how, how, how high an aspiration it is to tell a story that really does land with people in their hearts and minds, and at the same time how not to blow it. As I, I will tell you honestly, I feel that C.S. Lewis, not Tolkien, but C.S. Lewis did sometimes by getting too heavy handed about the ideas that he was trying to promote in his stories. I think, unfortunately, they got in the way, personally, sometimes. Um, and the truest power is when the writer really gets out of the picture. And, and in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the kind of way the very best writers have been able to do, tell a story that really suddenly allows you to enter into that world and those characters and that adventure and ask those big lifetime questions. And there's no intermediate in the middle. There's no teachy, preachy voice in there. It's just, it's a, it's a story and you are part of it. That's the real success, I think. Thank you for asking the question. Yes, how about you? Um, you mentioned how you found your sort of true calling as a writer after successfully repressing that sort of in business school and, and afterwards. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, as we are all here in business school and may have some of those small voices in our head that we're trying to repress, um, what, how did you think about writing and your career when you were in business school and then immediately afterward, afterwards in, in finance, especially to, to well, let me, writing? Let, uh, that's a wonderful question. I'm going to set the stage though by saying I was at a very different business school called Harvard something <laughs> and, and with a very different personality and at a very different time, okay, so a gap of 40 years and a, uh, and a very much more of a corporate, top-down kind of approach to life. Um, in fact, 
part of how I coped, I'll tell you honestly, was I, it was hard. I suffered. And I actually formed a club. Uh, I found um, some like-minded friends who, who had this, this wild dream that maybe their lives could be something more than being the uh, product manager for a new kind of peanut butter and that that would be their tombstone someday. <laughs> they were really good at that. Um, so we had big ideas. Those are radical ideas. So I actually called this club the Square Peg Society of Harvard Business School. <laughs> there were seven of us. And we met, we met you know, uh, seven or eight times. And we had, we had discussions about you know, possibilities. Uh, and and one, of those, one of those people, a woman went on to work for the World Bank. Uh, um, and and um, uh, another um, decided to put together a solar energy company in, in Washington State. Another um, organized craft cooperatives in Central America. Uh, and, um, and, and people, I've lost track of the others, but my point is that we wanted to try and break beyond a little bit, but there really wasn't anything like the kind of supportive encouragement that you have here. I am, I will tell you, I am totally impressed with the, the merging of values and resources that happens right here at SGSB. And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a liberating thing, isn't it? And I'm, I'm looking over at my friend Don Wood, who was there at Harvard Business School the same time I was. And it's a pretty different experience, isn't it, Don? Fair to say. It is. Actually, I was here while he was at Harvard. My wife was at Harvard while he was, he was there. So she got the view of Tom and Harvard and all that. I guess I saw Don enough at, a, at, at <laughs> HBS because of that, that very powerful magnet he's married to um, that I, I merged you with the, the class experience. But, but the, real, the real point is um, there's something very healthy and open to be here now. This is not to say any of this is easy. But you have a much better shot at, at raising those questions very openly and with, with colleagues who also want to want to raise them and, 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 and share. Now, I, I'm going to actually drill down deeper in one little way, though, um, because you gave me the chance to use that word suffering. Uh, I actually think suffering is a good, useful thing. You don't want to prolong it too much. You don't want to make it uh, the, the modus operandi of your whole life. But you can learn a lot from it. Because if there are reasons why you are doing something that feels right in your head, in your mind, uh, pursuing a career in a certain way that makes great sense for this next juncture, but you also know is not going to be totally fulfilling or not what you really want for the long term, the, the, the second five years, the second the third five years, you're going you're gonna to have a little bit of inner anguish about that. Um, and, and that's a very useful thing, because that reminds you of what else is important. In other words, it reminds you of what matters most, to use the name of this speaker series. So I think a little suffering is actually a very helpful thing. In my, in my case, it was really important that, that I knew, while I was having a great time in the in the private equity sphere. I was learning tons. It was a lot of creativity, uh, great energy. My partners were terrific. We had a, it was, there was a lot of making it up as we went along. It was, you know, we were small and scrappy and we, we had an outsized good fortune. We were, all, all things were good and there were lots of smiles on the faces of our investors. But even then, I still wasn't fulfilled, and it really gave me a sense, okay, you know, after seven years, and, I, and, I was, and we were raising that next fund, and I knew if I said yes to that, being president of fund number two, that was making a promise to those shareholders, those investors, I'd be around here for another seven to ten years. By then, I'd probably be married and have a, a, a you know, house in Westchester County, and maybe the average 2.3 children, and where, where did those dreams go in, those, in that juncture? And it, it, so it was only because I was suffering, to a degree, I was aware of that choice when it came about and, and seized it. So I think, I think discomfort is not a bad thing. 
It's a very useful thing. But you have to t take it seriously and ask, why am I why am I uncomfortable? Why am I unfulfilled? What are my unmet longings? You know, these are really big questions. It's your life. It's your story. So you want to want to be honest about it. Yes, how about you? Do you think spending uh, time in the corporate world and achieving the level of success you did made it easier for you to make the jump? Um, did I think that, that spending time in the corporate world and having a reasonable amount of success made it easier? Absolutely, it did. Um, I mean, in the job market sense, it, it is easier to swim downstream than upstream. Uh, I, I, I never, if, if there was part of me that wanted to do this and, and be entrepreneurial in that, in that realm, uh, and there was, I'd always admired people who could start companies and, or make companies better or make them work. Uh, and that amount of creativity and the people skills involved and the financial skills involved, I always had had great positive feelings about that. And to be in that world for a while and also make a little money of my own, that was a great opportunity. And by the way, I knew at the beginning, I may not make any money, but I would sure make experience. I was going to really gain a lot in that way. Uh, it did work out well, and it made it much easier for me at that point when I had a career choice to say, yeah, I've got some money in the bank. I've got a, uh, some walking money. I'm going to leave a big amount of money on the table by doing this, but I've got plenty. And I really need to give this a try. Or part of myself is really going to shrivel up and die. So it sure did make it easier. But you still have to take that step. So, yeah. How about you? Yes. So, my question sort of two parts, but this has to be. You talk about change that you create or anticipate and your approach to that. What about change that you don't expect, that you don't anticipate? and how do you write that into your own story? And does that ever happen when you're writing? Does the story go into a direction you didn't expect and how do you handle it? Ah, oh, yes. You know, that's a wonderful question because, and I'm going to take it as one, because really, story and life, the answer is very much the same there in this way. I think, I think let's start with story first. I think to write a good story, in fact, I think actually to create anything, that's of substance, whether it's a story or a symphony or a business idea or to or build a new building, whatever you're creating, you have to use both sides of your brain to the fullest. Um, and, and to just be more specific about that, I'm sure you know the, the basic neuroscience that, that says that the, the right side of our brains that right half is really um, connected to the left hand, which, which is uh, the side that helps us know language, and that's the side where we, where we gain metaphor. The side that thinks in incomplete sentences, the side that, where our dreams come from. Whereas the right hand, the left side of the brain, is connected to the rational, logical side of ourselves and our brains. Uh, the side that, that go, knows to go A, B, C, D, or skip A to Z, but, but has a direction and, and, and some ideas of how to get there. And, and really uh, makes, makes plans, organizes, makes things happen. So honestly, I am really glad to have, uh, well, well, it's arguable how well both halves of my brain function. They, they, I at least have some access to both halves. Uh, and just ask Brooks and his siblings about that question. Um, but both halves of my brain I can draw on. And when I'm writing a book, I always start, to be honest with you, I start with the rational, logical side. I, 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 it's the easier landing place for me. I begin there, I write an outline, I get into details about the characters and, the, and their arcs, that where, you know, um, young boy washes ashore, no memory at all, who he is. Turns out to be Merlin, the greatest wizard of all times. Uh, I, you know, I knew that arc, but there was a whole lot in the middle that I had no clue what, what it was going to be. So, uh, and also, by the way, in those Merlin stories, I had no idea. I thought I was writing one book about the life of young Merlin that would fill in the gap of his lore before he became that great exalted wizard. <clears throat> um, and that book tur turned into a trilogy 
And then somewhere in the middle of that trilogy, I realized, you know, <clears throat> this is really going to take five books to really get him to grow from that wet rag of washed ashore to being the greatest mentor and wizard of all times who could be the, the, you know, the inspiration for Camelot and King Arthur and all of that. So I actually called my editor in the middle there and said, you know, this trilogy, uh, I finally figured out it's a five-book trilogy. <laughs> and uh, and she, she was all there. She said, absolutely, you go for it. We'll just change the contract. But now, I, take, I tell you that example because that's an example of how the right side of my brain, the left hand, was suddenly intruding in there. I was getting, I was getting to know that character better. In fact, it took three whole drafts of book one before, three whole drafts in my writing room where little Brooks would come up and ask, is it time for more chocolate cake? <laughs> uh, before I could hear Merlin's voice, because that's, by the way, we really, where a character really steps off the page and becomes a living, breathing person, is when you hear their voice. And then, if you're really with them, I, you will ask that character, what is your deepest, darkest secret? And then in their own voice, they'll tell you something that will surprise even you. But it, it comes from somewhere deep in that, in that right, side, right hemisphere. All of this, what I'm trying to get at is there's an interaction here, and you have to let go of the rational in order to let that irrational, dreamlike voice come in. But it's the merging of the two that makes it work. Because if you just deal with the dreamlike, we've all read things that are free association and maybe have flashes of beauty, but they don't, they don't take you anywhere. And, and, you, and I think we human beings are really wired to, to take in our best ideas through stories. But you have to have a story that, 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 that you, can, you can follow, characters you believe in, a place you can enter in, all of those, all those qualities to really make it work. So that's where you need both halves. That's where you need the... Um, the top and the bottom and the left and the right and just have a, a whole story. I'll give you one last image and it's a metaphor. So it's coming from that half. But I've often thought that, that when I start a story, as when I start out at a time in life where I'm not sure what's next, I, I begin by processing what I see, what I, what I can hear, what my senses tell me right off the top. And then, and, and it's like I'm in, I'm in a kayak on the ocean, and I can see uh, the, the waves, I can smell the briny breeze, I can hear the, the screeching of the seagulls. You know, I'm there. In my rational mind, I'm paddling, I'm on the water surface, and then I keep paddling out, and somehow out of those deep, dark waves that I can't possibly fathom how deep they are, something moves and something bursts up above the surface and a huge humpback whale breaches and water is streaming off the fins and, fl and flippers and I'm, I'm, I'm dazzled by the size and scale and so totally shocked. My heart's pounding, but that whale, when it crashes down to the sea and the waves rock my little kayak, I know that whale was there all the time. I just didn't perceive it yet. So it's not just what we see, but it's what we can't see. And a good story, like a good time in life, has all of that. Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> I, you got me going a little bit. I so, uh, can't resist. Yes? Can you talk a little more about your decision to go into private equity and what role the ambition to make money play for you at that stage in your career? Yeah. Um, honestly, um, at the time I was at Harvard, my, the, the, the vast majority of people in my, in my graduating class would go into either consulting or investment banking. And, and a, a few in the top corporate kind of uh, paths, but, but um, that was a really, there was, there was a lot of money in those places and it was a great way to get experience and also get exposed to so, so you could take that next step into the corporate realm. Um, and I, 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 found it, I found out pretty quickly that virtually nobody who was coming to Harvard Business School 
to interview with somebody I actually really did want to work for. And I had had I had a, a, a summer working for McKinsey. I'd done some other things uh, that were informing me, but I, I realized I really wasn't a big corporate person. What I wanted, so I, that was helpful experience. And I totally urge you to use your summers, and we learn really well by experiences that aren't fulfilling, as well as ones that are, if you're self-aware, to help you help you narrow in on that. So then, so I realized what I wanted was something a little smaller, mixing it up, and and I also realized that oh, where I had great admiration for people in business was when they had to solve problems about starting companies, building companies, the kinds of things that, that my friends Philip and Don do every day for a living, the, the kinds of, of creativity that really is you know, boundless and, by the way, if you do it well, can be really well rewarded. Um, I didn't come from a family with any money and it was actually a really nice idea to think, well, you know, I, I, could, I could pay for that cabin in the mountains and put a roof on it and maybe um, have, have a life built around that that this would allow. Um, I, I honestly, so I, I, I knew that was a real plus and it was it pretty much sealed the deal for me that I could have all that experience and also earn some real money if it worked out. But most of the money came in the